Morning, everybody. Morning. Always enjoy Warren's prayers. So insightful and uh, exactly what we need. Thank you, Warren, for that. Matches matches my prayer. So, um, Luke six. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter six. We're making some progress in our study of Luke's gospel. Warren referenced uh, this is a, a different gospel than uh, the other three. And what a privilege for us to uh, have uh, before us this morning uh, Dan's message on uh, John 3.16. I know we're all looking forward to that. John, a very different gospel than Luke's. Luke's different than uh, Matthew's, both of them uh, quite similar to, to Mark's. But anyway, that's not what we're going to talk about uh, in our last, last lesson out of chapter 6. So that's where we are, Luke chapter 6. In verses 12 through 16, Jesus chose uh, his 12 disciples, or, or better, his 12 apostles. And so he has selected uh, the men who will be the primary accomplices in the greater work he has planned, though their understanding of it at this time, these 12 who he has chosen, uh, their understanding of it would prove to be woefully inadequate. And that needed remedy. Uh, there is a principle that we find throughout the Bible, going all the way back to the very beginning, to Adam and Eve, uh, that the Lord never asked of his servants uh, what he will not also prepare and equip them for. Uh, you think about Adam and Eve, uh, for whom God had a veritable paradise in which they were to cultivate the earth and uh, exercise dominion uh, and lovingly subdue the earth. Uh, from them to Abraham and, and to the fathers, and then uh, for Moses, uh, God had a mighty work that he wanted him to uh, accomplish, uh, daunting on the face of it, but for which God prepared him and, and armed him uh, for it. David and Solomon and the prophets all were given momentous missions to accomplish, and God prepared and equipped them uh, for each. To Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, uh, to whom God gave that great privilege to, to bear his own son. Uh, he did it, but not without also covering her in uh, his grace in order to strengthen and enable her. And now here in this sixth chapter of our gospel, we are presented with the 12 whom Jesus chose, and this principle applies to them as well. Uh, now, uh, not just in the verses we'll study today, but in the balance of the chapter, he will address them and describe what will be their likely experience as they follow him, how they should operate and conduct themselves, and the inevitable outcome and reward that is to be theirs at the end of their faithful service. In short, uh, he prepares them. He prepares them. And the same is true for every disciple of Jesus Christ, including you and me. And so these verses apply to us uh, as well, as with Matthew's account of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, uh, the Lord describes what it will mean to be his disciple. So you remember uh, the Lord had uh, gone up to the mountain to pray. Uh, his disciples had come up to him. Uh, and out on the mount, and out of those disciples, he chose 12 apostles. And now we read in verse 17, Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place. And there was a large crowd of his disciples, and a great throng of people from all Judea and Jerusalem. So we're in uh, Galilee. Uh, so they've come up from Judea in general. They've come up from uh, Jerusalem. And they've come from the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon. They'd come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were being cured. 
And all the people were trying to touch him, for power was coming from him and healing them all. And turning his gaze toward his disciples, he began to say, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. But woe to you, but woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. Uh, woe to you who laugh now. So these are terrible things as we read through them. You're so familiar with them. But uh, woe to you who laugh now. You shall mourn and, and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. For their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. If we were to continue reading the sermon, uh, we would find Jesus urging upon the disciples what is essentially the golden rule, uh, to treat others as you would like them to treat you. That's in verses 27 through 42, uh, followed in the balance of the chapter by an exhortation to obedience in these two illustrations that you're familiar with as well the good tree that produces good fruit, and uh, the house uh, built on the rock that stands even against the strongest uh, storms. And so with this sermon, Jesus is preparing them and equipping them for what is to come. When I was in high school, I was on the football team. If you thought you were going to get through your church experience on Super Bowl Sunday without a (laughs) football illustration, you're sorely mistaken. Um, Our head coach, Brian Adams High School, was Bob Cowser, and it was his practice to sit the team down at the very beginning before we ever hit the field, uh, before we ever had, you know, full pad practice, and address us in regard to his overall expectations for us for the season. He was outlining uh, what it would take to be successful while also preparing us for what to expect. My junior year, uh, we had quite the football team, Brian Adams did. Uh, We had probably seven or eight guys that went on to play college football. Uh, The University of Oklahoma, uh, the University of Texas, two went to the University of Houston, a running back to um, Tulane. Uh, one of them went on to be an All-American, and then he played 10 years uh, for the Detroit Lions. He was an NFL All-Pro uh, football player. So uh, we had quite the team, and as we sat before our coach that junior year, he was intensely serious. I don't remember, naturally, uh, much of what he said, but I do remember his closing line because he looked at us and he said, men, I think we can win 16 games this year. You can win the state championship. That's what he was was saying. Well, we slipped up. Uh, We lost one game. Uh, We didn't win uh, the state championship, but I still had another year, and so uh, fast forward to my senior year, uh, sitting in the same locker room at the same time and the same Coach Kowser uh, addressing us to prepare us for the season, and I don't remember much of that address either, except again, his closing declaration, man, I think we can win eight, nine games this year. (laughs) 
Well, his forecast proved to be a tad generous. <laughs> what Coach was saying what this was that this team was a house built upon the sand. <laughs> but at least he prepared us for it. So Luke begins his narrative of the sermon by setting the stage. Having selected the 12 apostles out of the more general lot of disciples, Jesus came down from the unnamed mountain where they had been and found a level place on which to stand. And because the content of the sermon that Luke now records overlaps to some degree with the content of Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, uh, many have speculated over the years that each is a different version of what was one identical sermon. And they do contain similarities, but they also bear some differences. Each uh, has these beatitudes that we have just read, uh, but Luke's are limited to four uh, as opposed to Matthew's eight or, or nine. Uh, plus, uh, Luke includes these, these corresponding four woes, uh, which are absent from the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the sermon Luke gives lacks that focus on the law uh, and explaining the true meaning of the law that we see in the Sermon on the Mount, but that can be explained probably because of the individual focus that Matthew had on the Jews and Luke on the Gentiles. And there's much more we could say in the way of comparing and contrasting the two, but the reality is that Jesus uh, preached such sermons on more than one occasion uh, using bits and pieces of the same content in different contexts and to different uh, audiences. So it is more than likely that this sermon uh, was preached at a, a different time than the Sermon on the Mount. The purpose was the same, however, to lay out before his disciples the expectations and responsibilities that belong to them as disciples. It doesn't seem that long ago to me that we studied the Sermon on the Mount uh, here in this room, and you re may remember that Matthew set the stage for that sermon as well, noting that Jesus went up on a mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Well, here, the, the setting seems a bit different. Uh, Jesus is portrayed as coming down from a mountain with his disciples, and then standing on a level place. And it's for that reason that the sermon is often uh, labeled uh, the Sermon on the Plain in order to distinguish it from Matthew's. And one popular commentator, or preacher really, even titled his sermon, The Sermon on the Level, uh, because in it, uh, Jesus seems to have really leveled with his uh, disciples. Well, Luke describes the assembling of the people who were present in verse 17. Uh, there were the apostles, of course, who were accompanying him down from the mount, but also a larger crowd of his disciples. Maybe it was the larger crowd that had, from which he had chosen the 12 apostles. Uh, but additionally, Luke writes, a great throng of people from as far away as Judah and the city of Jerusalem and those port cities uh, of the Northwest. Jesus' popularity uh, was growing rapidly. Uh, and Luke suggests at least two reasons for that. Uh, they came to hear him, and they came to be uh, healed of their diseases. His renown for both had been spreading. Uh, Luke's already commented about that. In chapter 4, verse 22, uh, he wrote how all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And these early uh, chapters of the gospel are, are filled with Jesus' uh, healings, whether it was physical healings like paralysis or uh, leprosy uh, or uh, these, these spiritual uh, uh, demonic oppression that he would run to. Jesus was healing them all, no matter physical or spiritual. He was the sympathetic Savior in action. And God's Spirit 
had filled him such that his holy power responded to the slightest touch in the eyes of many poor souls, I'm sure, he was a miracle worker like they had never seen. Luke introduces the sermon by telling us Jesus turned his gaze toward the disciples. You should note that. He turned his gaze toward the disciples. But that can't mean that his words were intended only for them. For in verse 27, if you look down there, he'll invite all who are willing to hear him to respond to the message. And his illustration of the two very different uh, builders at the end of the sermon is clearly a warning shot at those in attendance who have not yet made a decision to follow him. You, look, you've got two foundations you can build your house upon. So he was addressing not just the disciples. And yet his words this day were intended primarily for his disciples as a description of what a disciple ought to be. Uh, the very direct second person plural, blessed are you, reinforces that. Uh, we may even say it gives us a, a profile of the responsibilities belonging to a Christian. That's who we are. We're, we're, we're Christians. But coming from the lips of our Lord, they would have also had the power uh, to affect the unconverted throngs as well. Now you'll note the structure of today's passage, the, the first section of uh, the sermon. Uh, there are four blessings, or we call them beatitudes, followed by four woes that correspond to those uh, beatitudes. The Greek word is actually makarios, uh, but it was the influence of the Latin Vulgate version of the Bible that has given us the descriptive beatitude that we commonly use uh, because the Latin translation of Makarios is beatus, and since in the subsequent history of the church, uh, the scriptures and the theology of the scriptures were transmitted in that a Latin language, these blessings came down to us not as uh, a macarism, but as the, the Beatitudes. And at the risk of being uh, repetitious, because um, many of you have been taught this and studied the Sermon on, on the Mount so many times, uh, this word uh, blessed cannot be understood uh, simply as happy. Uh, it's, it's more than that. Yes, there is a certain kind of happiness attached to it, but not as that word is so commonly used today, the sort of happiness entirely dependent upon circumstances. Our, our circumstances can change as quickly as uh, the, the ringing of your phone, uh, the email with, with the lab results. But Jesus is not referring to uh, a subjective state like that when he states that the poor and the hungry and the weeping and the persecuted are blessed. Uh, rather, he is making an objective judgment uh, more concerned with God's appraisal of them. Uh, their blessing is entirely subsumed in God's view of them. We're blessed because God thinks of us in a certain way. That's why we're blessed. And so the sermon begins with a, a contrast between two entirely different groups of, of people, two completely different outlooks on life. The first group is those whom the world generally ignores or, or worse, shuns and denigrates. The world pities them, but God promises reward beyond imagination. The second group is the world's darlings. Uh, they are the arrogant ones of Psalm 73, for example, who are wealthy and untroubled and for whom, as the psalmist says, pride is their necklace. Uh, the imaginations of their heart run riot. We know these people, we run into them, uh, they have seemingly bottomless uh, resources. They speak from on high, the, the psalmist says. 
They have set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue parades through the earth. Uh, the Lord wanted to identify for his disciples these two groups juxtaposed one against uh, the other. Uh, his direct audience was a, a band of eager, new, and enthusiastic subscribers to his cause, and he knew they needed uh, the urgent, radical reorientation of their thinking this sermon would entail. Kent Hughes described them as four spiritual H-bombs, concentrated theological epigrams that detonate with increasing effect, blowing away shallow talk of discipleship and thereby calling for a true commitment. Well, the first beatitude is in verse 20. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. There are two primary Greek words uh, that we translate as poor. One of them is penis. The other one is patoikoi. I always do this. Patokoi. Uh, penis, P-E-N-E-S, is a word uh, describing a person who has nothing to, to spare. It's not the word that Jesus uh, used. He said, blessed are the patokoi. Uh, and that word describes one uh, completely destitute. He has nothing at all. Now, the Bible doesn't uh, describe uh, physical poverty as a blessing. We should say that at the beginning. Uh, wealth uh, rather, is usually viewed as a sign of God's blessing, uh, while poverty is uh, often a sign of the fruit of a godless life. Uh, the Proverbs that Mike has, has been teaching to us bear that out over and over again. What's the, what's the outcome of the sluggard's life, of, of the rebellious life? It's poverty. Matthew's First beatitude helps us here, for you recall that Matthew cited Jesus' opening remark as blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, these are those who have come to understand they are completely and utterly destitute in the inner man, in, in, the, uh, in the realm of the spirit. They, they acknowledge their spiritual poverty before God. It's no surprise that Jesus would have begun his sermon here as well with the blessed state of the person who recognizes that he's a spiritual pauper and that that is his greatest need. Nothing in my hand I bring, only to thy cross I cling. That's the anthem of all those who have been so enlightened and recognize our true need, no matter our relative material uh, circumstances. For such as these, the poor in spirit, the arrival of Jesus Christ on the scene could not be matched by any material boon. He was the very thing their heart longed for, and he had early on indicated his own self-awareness of that when he began his public ministry back in chapter 4 of Luke, you remember, in the synagogue. In Nazareth, he had asked for the scroll of Isaiah. He opened it up to Isaiah chapter 61, and he, he read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He handed the scroll back, and he declared in the hearing of all of them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Uh, the one who would vindicate the spiritually impoverished was on the scene, in other words. He had arrived. It must have been incredibly heartening. So this first of the Beatitudes is re really the key to all that follows. It's the fundamental requirement of the Christian. And once embraced, it is the key to entry into the kingdom of God. That's what the Lord promises. Yours is the kingdom of God. He put it in the present tense. Yours is the kingdom of God. The promises that, that, the promises that follow are all in the future tense, notice. 
Uh, but Jesus' encouragement is that for such as these, uh, the kingdom, I would say for such as you, uh, the kingdom uh, is, belongs to you in the here and now. The visible rewards may come later, but the possession of it is, is, is the present experience. And so we come to the, the second beatitude, and the, the connection is obvious. Those who are poor are inevitably hungry. Uh, verse 21, blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. And again, uh, Matthew's version amplifies the Lord's meaning in which Jesus adds for righteousness. Those of you who hunger for righteousness, those who recognize their poverty of spirit inevitably hunger and thirst after righteousness. By that, he, 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 he meant that they hunger and thirst for that right standing before God that will find his welcoming embrace of us. Righteousness. It's the spiritual delights to be found in the presence of a loving Savior that the disciple of Jesus more and more longs for. That's the experience of, of, of a disciple. Uh, King David expressed it poetically in Psalm 42.1, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? We get distracted <laughs> from such an attitude. Uh, there's all the things of the world and the flesh and, and the devil. But don't you know that our loved, loved friends and family who are suffering today, their soul is longing for God like never before. So we're to understand there's a great feast to be had if, if, if we can only see straight uh, the 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 uh, picture will be made explicit for us later in chapter 16. Think of chapter 16 of Luke. Jesus tells the story of Lazarus and the rich man. And Lazarus, uh, so poor and hungry uh, in the present, so poor and hungry on earth, longing to be fed from the crumbs that recklessly fall off the rich man's a table, but then Lazarus dies, and and he was carried away by angels to Abraham's bosom, where he was comforted, and he feasted, and he was to feast uh, forever. Then the roles uh, were reversed. Th then uh, the, uh, the former rich man who had hungered not for righteousness, but for the riches and delicacies of this life agonizingly, you remember, agonizingly pleaded for the good things of heaven, but it was too late. Those who hunger for righteousness in, in this life, however, will be satisfied, Jesus says, because they had recognized their true need. Uh, they will be satisfied because of that. Once it had looked like they had it all wrong. They looked, it looked like they were foolish. But God will vindicate those who have thrown in their lot with his son. And that's a challenge I know we all face in this world of abundance, of recognizing what our true need is and then directing our energies there instead of upon the things that merely satisfy for uh, the moment. And so may the Lord deliver us. I know you agree with me. May he deliver us uh, from such short-sightedness uh, that we might not seek to satiate earthly desires, but instead, as Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 3, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Keep seeking those things where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth a consistent lesson uh, from God's word. The third beatitude is uh, also in verse 21. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Some of you I know are more perceptive than others of us, and you notice that whereas 
uh, Matthew's sermon, in back in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, pronounces uh, a blessing on those who mourn as the second beatitude in Matthew chapter 5. Luke's version does not have that beatitude. It may be that the Lord was conveying the same thought here in different words. But this is not a reference to the kind of people that we often refer to as weepy kind of of personalities for whom every day is an, another opportunity to bemoan some terrible thing in uh, their lives. And trust me, I know there are a lot of terrible things going on in people's lives and they have reason to bemoan. But this describes the person who is sensitive to the sin and evil in the world and to the world's unbelief and rebellion against God and his holiness. Our world is a horrible mess. Uh, it's depressing uh, to turn on the news. It's depressing to uh, open up uh, the newspaper. And so many uh, innocent bear the consequences. But these people, when they understand God's providence and his sovereignty uh, over even the evil in the wor world, are able to laugh. The Bible is such an interesting book. Uh, God is said to laugh. And Jesus is captured weeping. He who sits in the heavens laughs, says Psalm 2, of the potentates and the world's elite who devise evil, all these evil schemes against him. He laughs and he scoffs because the futility of their defiance of him is known to him and, and certain. But the God-man, Jesus become flesh, making his way to Jerusalem for his faithful visit, despaired, despaired over the city, crying out, as you know, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you would not have it. Later, he would stand outside Lazarus' tomb and weep deeply over the consequences of sin on this planet in, among men and women. This is the weeping he identifies now, the deep sorrow for the world as it is. Uh, we look upon it, we live in it, and we are deeply sorrowful at what we see and what we endure. Uh, broken families, hopeless children, the scourge of uh, abortion, the twisted perversion of all that is good and beautiful in men and women made in God's image, magnified by a largely godless and manipulative media wielding the power of bias in their reporting. We look at the nations of the world and, and we weep at the political corruption and moral cowardice of so many of our leaders. There's much to weep over if we pause to review, but in the future, God knows there will be great joy and laughter. And our deep faith in God's great promises allows us, even now, if not a, a hearty laugh, at least a thankful smile, uh, knowing that God is on his throne and he's causing all things to work together for those who love him. The last beatitude is the blessing of suffering for standing up for Christ. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and weep for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. The apostle advised Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And that's what Jesus describes. This is not suffering in general. We have plenty of that too. Uh, but suffering on account of one's faithfulness and testimony to Christ. And note the progression from hate to exclusion to public insult and then finally 
to the defamation of your name. But we should not pity ourselves. We belong to a royal line. That is exactly the way all those faithless, soulless Israelite fathers of old treated God's chosen prophets. It was all for the sake of the Lord. And when we suffer like them today, it is all for the sake of Christ. If we follow him faithfully, we should expect to suffer. Leon Morris summed it up well when he wrote, Jesus promised his followers that they would be absurdly happy, but also that they would never be out of trouble. And now the woes follow. Uh, they correspond in a negative fashion to the four blessings, so we'll uh, go through them quite quickly. Uh, the poor are blessed, but woe to you who are rich. Notice. The hungry are blessed, uh, but woe to you who are well fed now. Those who weep are blessed, but woe to you who laugh now. Those who suffer for Christ are blessed, but woe to you when all men speak well of you. For their fathers, note, used to treat the false prophets in the same way. Well, we don't typically pronounce woes on people. Some of you do, maybe, I don't know. But uh, in the rare cases we do do that, we mean them as pronouncements of judgment. We can be that way. Uh, but when used by the Lord, the woe, woe was intended as an expression of pity for those who had come into an unenviable uh, condition. Uh, rather than envying the proud rich, uh, Jesus clarifies that we should pity them instead because they are enjoying now the very best they will have for eternity and their pleasures will be very brief. Uh, the language, you're receiving your comfort in full, was used for commercial receipts to indicate paid in full. The debt is paid. Uh, these are the rich whose largesse centered only upon their pleasures and their own gain and not to assist the poor or those who were uh, in, in, in need or, or helpless. Had they been less selfish and, and more loving and kind, uh, they might have laid up for themselves treasure in heaven. But as it was, their account is paid in full. It's closed. And those who are well-fed now are the ones who have found their satisfaction, even their deepest meaning, perhaps, in the pleasures and things uh, they have accumu accumulated so that they believe they have need for nothing else. Uh, certainly not God and his Christ. Their future is frightening indeed, as they will soon hunger but find no relief. Those who are laughing now will, will soon uh, mourn and weep. Of course, the, the Lord was not uh, recommending gloominess. Uh, traveling around with Peter and the others, there must have been a lot of laughter and good-natured ribbing. The Lord was in the perfect position, if you think about it, to tease and to laugh with the motley crew that he had uh, surrounding him. But, but this is the laughter of the boastful and the arrogant who look down today upon those who in their minds are wasting their time and energies on the fantasy and pipe dreams of what they call uh, moralism or, or religion. But their laughter will be turned into mourning. How horrible. No wonder he said, whoa, I pity you. Uh, this is what the psalmist discovered in Psalm 73. Uh, when he entered into the sanctuary of God and he perceived therein how God had set them in slippery places and he cast them down to destruction. Like, like a dream when one awakes, the psalmist warned, O oh Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. How horrible. And finally, woe to you when all men speak well of you. I pity you, the Lord says. Your good reputation among men, pristine, can only have come at the price of compromise. 
if all man, men accept you into their circle, you cannot have stood up ever for anything that would have made them uncomfortable. You must have put pleasing them ahead of faithfulness to the Lord. And then Jesus employs a bit of parallelism to reinforce his point. You're not like the prophets, these people. You're like the false prophets of old who would say and do whatever would gain the favor of those evil kings. Well, so that's the first part of uh, the Sermon on the Plain. As I said, uh, the Lord said these things primarily to his disciples. Uh, but there were many there who had not made the decision to follow after him. They had other motives for being there, or they were mer merely curious. But Jesus' words uh, must have been a shot across the bow. Uh, here is this throng of people. They were coming from all over to see him and receive from him, uh, perchance even to become his disciple. His words were likely the most comprehensive revelation of what that might entail, and they could only have been intimidated or perplexed. Uh, these were spiritual aspirations that required a work of the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, two entirely different groups of people described by the Lord, and here was a template uh, useful to identify which you are a part of. But for the apostles, the sermon was a giant step toward preparing them for the task ahead. They must have wondered, is this what we must be? Is, is this what we have signed up for? But the Lord had more to say, and we look forward to forging ahead in our study uh, in two weeks, Lord willing. Uh, with this song, perhaps in our hearts, Lead on, O King Eternal, the day of March has come. Henceforth, in fields of conquest, your tents shall be our home. Through days of preparation, your grace has made us strong. And now, O King Eternal, we lift our battle song. Father, we pray that that would be our battle song. Uh, you've given us a mission. You are have prepared us for it, and you are preparing us for it, and you have given us a description of what it looks like. So, Lord, uh, we confess to you that we are uh, impoverished in spirit apart from your grace, but you have been gracious to us. You have revealed yourself to us. How we uh, wonder at your goodness and mercy and patience, long-suffering uh, with us and delight in it, uh, to think that you have adopted us into your family in such grace and we have the resources of the Holy Spirit who lives within us and our own Savior, the Lord Jesus, at your side interce interceding on our behalf. May we live uh, lives uh, pleasing to you as your disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.